So I'd like to welcome um, everyone back. I appreciate seeing um, so many of you. It's been a while since our last meeting. And this is my first meeting as the chair of the PEC. And really, I like that sound, chair of the PEC. <laughs> I'd like to begin by recognizing um, some of the elected officials that are joining us today. I'll start with um, Dave Reichert of Washington, my good friend. Um, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Reichert, who recently assumed the chairmanship of the Trade Subcommittee on Ways and Means. And we all look forward to continuing to work with you. It's been a long and good run so far. Um, I'd like to also welcome uh, Representative Dan Kilday of Michigan. Dan, thank you. In addition, I'd like to extend particular thanks to Mayor Buckhorn of Tampa. May I sit down? Thank you, Mayor. Um, who is us, with us today representing the, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, thank you all for being here. A number of the President's top advisors and cabinet members are with us as well. I'd like to welcome Valerie Jarrett sitting next to me. Thank you, Valerie. Senior advisor to the President. Um, people will be coming in and out, so I'll call them when they do arrive. Um, and Secretary Penny Pritzker of the Commerce Department. Um, who else do we have here? Yeah, Del Beni, Congresswoman, she came in. Ah, how are you? Del Beni, Congresswoman Del Beni, thank you very much. Administrator Maria Contreras-Sweet of the SBA is here as well. Um, Fred Hochberg the chairman and the president of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. Um, Fred is here. Thank you, Fred. And uh, I don't know if Lee Zak came in. Yeah, good, Lee, good. Thank you very much. Um, who's the uh, director of Trade and Development Agency. Did I miss anyone who's here? If not good, I'll call the rest of them when they do come in. Thanks to all of you for being here and other administration officials who are sitting around the table as well. We look forward to your participation in today's discussion. Since we last met in June, the administration has made significant progress in advancing the President's trade agenda. First, I want to congratulate the President and his economic team for their success in concluding the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. As all of you probably know, TPP will eliminate more than 18,000 tariffs that currently impede the competitiveness of U.S. exports. The TPP will establish stronger rules and new disciplines for increasing transparency and maintaining a more level playing field for U.S. exporters. And the TPP will promote further growth in a digital economy. U.S. exporters across all sectors of the American economy have come to rely on digital commerce and data flows in their daily business operations. New rules in the TPP push back against digital protectionism and will help promote the development of a global digital marketplace. That will benefit U.S. manufacturers, farmers, ranchers, and service providers, as well as workers and consumers. It's actually a remarkable accomplishment, particularly considering that 12 governments had to reach a consensus in order to conclude this agreement, 12 governments. The text of the agreement has been, uh, now been published, and people can evaluate for themselves the many benefits of the TPP. It's a great potential for driving economic growth in the United States and across the Pacific Rim. In a little while, we'll hear um, more about TPP from Ambassador Froman, Mr. Zainz, welcome, who will brief uh, the PEC on the status of the President's trade agenda. And we will also hear from Chairman Furman, who will brief the PEC on the state of the global economy and the emerging economic issues that we face heading into 2016. The PEC also needs to review and approve the letters of priority recommendations the letter of priority recommendations to the President from the private sector members of the Council. I want to thank all the private sector members of the PEC for their focus and hard work in developing these recommendations. Not every member could be here today, but every member provided substantive input, and I am grateful for that work. I have more to say on the recommendations later in the meeting. So we have a really full agenda today, and we do have a hard stop. And we also have some very important issues to discuss. Um, I'd like to welcome Jeff Zients. Thank you. National Economic Council. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge our new vice chair, Arnie Sorensen from Marriott, who was designated by the president after our last meeting in June. We all look forward to working with you. 
Um, and if you have any comments, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have uh, very big shoes to fill. <laughs> Maybe that's not a polite that's thing not to a say. Uh, uh, but very, very pleased to uh, continue to do what uh, I can to help this really important agenda and would simply echo uh, Ursula's comments. Congratulations to President Obama and to the administration for the tremendous progress that has been made, particularly with TPP. A uh, lot of work yet to be done, and as we talked a little bit at breakfast this morning, we, we do uh, come together uh, this morning in an environment in which some of the uh, global engagement uh, seems to be at threat uh, and uh, I think in many respects have got to continue to redouble our efforts both to get TPP passed but to make sure that we remain in an environment in which the opportunities that come from global engagement can continue to be achieved. Thank you very much. Secretary um, Fox, Transportation, thank you for arriving. I'd like to turn it over to Valerie Jarrett for some opening remarks. Uh, thank you so much, Chairperson Ursula Burns. It does have a nice ring to it. Uh, and also to your new Vice Chair, who will have to do um, what you used to do in heels going backwards. He'll just have to do it with his flat feet flat going feet. forward. So, uh, But I was thinking, um, as you were speaking this morning, that I've been at every PEC meeting since its inception. And the ideas and recommendations and advice and counsel that you have given the president have been instrumental uh, and have helped shape the policies that we have put in place. And so on his behalf, I just want to thank you for your service and hope that you feel that your um, contribution um, has not only been valued but is now being turned into real policy policies that have moved our country forward. Um, thank you both for mentioning TPP, you will be hearing more from Ambassador Froman, who's just arrived. You can come on in. Um, <laughs> welcome. He and his team and the economic team and, and Secretary Pritzker and all of the cabinet, uh, not to mention, of course, the president and vice president have put an enormous amount of effort into this. But again, uh, the private sector's um, input was invaluable in crafting um, an agreement that we believe uh, not only gives the United States a strong competitive edge, but it's also good for working families and, and businesses in America, which was what it was all about. So we thank you for that as well. Uh, I had a chance to brief the President last night on the recommendation, the letter that you will be putting forth and discussing today, and he asked me to thank you for that. The policies that you laid in that, out on that are obviously very consistent with the themes of the administration. And so, again, you are um, taking up his challenge of advising us on policies that we could implement that from your experience in the private sector as well as the elected officials who are here today give us and continue to give us that competitive edge. So again, thank you all for your service and your contribution to this invaluable um, Export Council. Welcome. Next I'd like to call on Jeff Zients for his opening remarks. Jeff. Thank you. Um, I too will uh, uh, defer to Mike and others on TPP, but I will say that this will be a top priority for 2016 and you will see uh, that reflected in the President's calendar and the whole Cabinet's calendar uh, in terms of emphasis and push the same way that we put, we're all out in partnership with you on TPA. The same play will be run on TPP so that uh, we look forward to a busy and successful 2016 on TPP. I thought I would just very quickly highlight a few economic priorities where we are hopeful that we can make some progress actually across the next few weeks. Um, as Secretary Fox uh, has been a champion and the President has been a champion of strengthening our infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, you know, we all think of the state of our current infrastructure as uh, no longer a source of great global competitive advantage. In fact, uh, we're no longer even in the top ten in infrastructure, which is we're used to being number one. Um, so we've got to make serious progress here. The good news is it is highly likely that, that Congress will pass for the first time in a long time uh, a longer-term infrastructure bill. Uh, it's not everything that we need in this country, but it's a step in the right direction, and we are hopeful that that will get done uh, in short order, and that's a heck of a lot better than the short-term patches, the more than 30 short-term patches that we've had, and it allows uh, states and municipalities to do the type of planning that all of you do in business and other settings to, to really make some progress. So that's uh, uh, not to get ahead of things, but that looks very promising, as does the XM Bank, finally, uh, which is obviously front and center for exporters. Uh, it's terrible that we actually have had five months of no XM Bank. It's unacceptable. 
Uh, that said, uh, that, that long nightmare should be over uh, soon, and we will be uh, back in business at the XM Bank, and I'm sure we'll hear more, to, more, more about that from Fred, but we're very optimistic that that gets done uh, soon, uh, before the end of the year, certainly. And the last thing I'll touch on is the budget. As you'll recall, the spending levels were decided upon uh, uh, earlier this um, fall, uh, but Congress uh, needs to finish the job and finish the job by putting the detailed budget in place, uh, the appropriations levels, and to do so in a way that we do not trip, trip up a budget process with ideological riders, uh, that uh, you know, we, uh, the deadline for this is coming up across the next week or two. And uh, again, the spending levels are all the hard parts behind us in terms of traditional budgeting, and we cannot have ideological riders interfere with uh, the budget process and, um, uh, and in any way uh, trip up um, all the good progress we're making in the economy. So we're hopeful that that will get completed. So if you lift up across the next few weeks, finally a longer term infrastructure plan, the uh, reauthorization of the XM Bank and a uh, good budget in place are, are the goals and we're hopeful we can achieve those. Thank you very much. Um, Secretary Perez, welcome. Good to see you again. I'd like to now um, turn it over to um, <coughs> Secretary Pritzker. Thank you, Ursula, and again, congratulations on your new position, and Arnie, welcome to your uh, position as well. Um, I'm very excited to continue working together with both of you and the entire PEC. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge our friend and colleague, Pat Wirtz, who has been an extraordinarily effective member of the PEC, and this will be her final meeting. Uh, Pat, you have served as a committed and valued member of the President Obama's PEC since the very beginning. And uh, you were by our side uh, at our fact-finding mission last year in Turkey and Poland, and you and your team have made significant contributions to the work of this council, particularly on domestic infrastructure investment and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So we really appreciate and thank you for your dedicated service, and you will be missed. Uh, throughout the administration, uh, the President's Export Council has been a leading contributor to our country's international trade agenda, and your actions which included submitting nearly 60 letters of recommendation, have actually shaped this administration's key accomplishments, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, Trade Promotion Authority, the single window system to streamline the export and import process, and building a more transparent export control system. Um, as we enter the final year, uh, the administration, as you've heard from uh, my colleagues, remains laser focused on achieving uh, as many of our remaining shared goals as possible. Obviously, our largest focus will be the passage of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But I want to thank you for your effort on uh, Trade Promotion Authority. It was absolutely, your partnership was critical to uh, the passage of trade of TPA and your vocal and visible support for TPP will be critical for us to get that across the finish line. Um, and our team, working closely with Ambassador Froman's team, are, are uh, uh, committed to working with you all to in any way to elevate TPP within your community. So please feel free to let us know. Uh, if there are ways that we can support you within your communities getting the word out about that. And our March 2016 fact-finding trip to Japan and, and Vietnam will be an opportunity for us to learn more about what TPP can do uh, for American businesses in those two markets. Before I turn it back over to Ursula, I do want to highlight another opportunity and priority for the administration, which is the Hanover Mesa, which is the largest industrial technology trade fair in the world. For the very first time ever in its history, the United States is the official partner country 
for the April 2016 event in Hanover, Germany. And official partner country status provides an unparalleled opportunity for American businesses, your companies, uh, both for our manufacturers, but also frankly for our service companies as well, uh, to be front and center at the fair. Uh, we will have a, an, an important representation of leadership from uh, the U.S. government, and uh, Chancellor Merkel will be uh, leading her delegation there. So it's an opportunity as partner country. There are a significant number of events that we will be doing with the German government together. It's also an opportunity uh, uh, for you to meet with policymakers in the German government as well as our government. And I hope that uh, there will be a significant presence by the PEC at the fair, exhibiting at the fair, as well as there's an opportunity we've reserved um, the advertising, critical advertising opportunities on the fairgrounds at, for your uh, companies, and I hope also you will consider encouraging your supplier networks to attend the fair. Uh, this is a, a chance for the United States to uh, continue to advance our positioning as a leading provider of manufacturing uh, products and services globally. It's the fair is more than just a trade fair, it's a geopolitical event that has enormous visibility globally. Um, so I hope that you will participate and uh, 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 increase our presence there. Um, I know the, uh, I'll just close by saying that the recommendations that you put forth today I think are uh, incredibly relevant, particularly as it relates to, uh, from a commerce perspective, finalizing a new safe harbor framework. Uh, promoting job-driven work uh, training and workforce development and focus on our infrastructure. So I look forward to the conversation about our, your recommendations and I know that they will help to keep America more competitive and uh, keep America open for more business. So thank you very much. Thank you, Penny. Um, Hanover Fair, it's uh, interesting. We'll probably be there. Good, thank good, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, the other representatives from the executive branch to defer their comments for just a moment. I would now like to recognize our congressional members for some brief opening remarks, starting with Chairman Riker. Uh, thank you, Ursula, and, and congratulations uh, to you. And uh, Arnie, congratulations uh, to you. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure to be a part of this group for uh, the last uh, seven years, I think. Is it seven years? Um, I've been a member of the Trade Subcommittee for seven years, and as Ursula said uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was made uh, the chairman of the Trade Subcommittee. And in the last uh, uh, couple of weeks, uh, <laughs> Mike and I have been uh, on the phone and in meetings with uh, members of, of, of uh, the Ways and Means Republicans, and uh, I think we're making some great progress. And I just want to say thank you, a huge thank you to Mike and his uh, um, staff. Um, they've just been very, very uh, available and uh, listening intently and, and I think sincere and the members are picking up the sincerity and in your efforts in addressing the concerns that all of us know exist in this trade agreement. Uh, some of those you're very well aware of and are, uh, are going to be difficult, tobacco, uh, localization, uh, the biologics issues. Um, so, uh, but we're going to get through those uh, because we all understand how critical uh, this is and how important it is for American jobs and for us to lead and, and, and expect that high standard across the globe uh, in, in, in uh, global trade. But I, I also have to mention uh, briefly there's a special friend in the room. Uh, Gil Kurlikowski and I uh, go way back to the days when he was the Seattle police chief and I was the sheriff. <laughs> and uh, we kept things in, in uh, great order, right? Yeah. So here we are today together again serving, uh, serving our country in a, in a much different way. It's good to see you, my friend. 
Uh, it's great to see Susan Delbeni here too. Uh, she and I have a special connection. We ran against each other in 2010. <laughs> wow. I won, but you know, that's it. She's but I'm, it, she's here anyway. <laughs> Uh, it's great to have her because you have two Washington State uh, members of Congress who are really interested and recognize that trade is, is critical. Washington State, of course, being one of the most trade, well, is the most trade dependent state. So it's good to see Susan here, too. Uh, so a lot going on uh, on Capitol Hill, as you are all aware, very busy weeks um, behind us and busy weeks ahead of us. Um, proud to report that we are closer to a long-term highway bill. Uh, the uh, XM Bank issue uh, included in, in the language, and uh, I was one of 40 Republicans who joined uh, that signature uh, exercise, and also one of 10 who spoke on the floor in favor of XM Bank. I just wanted to share that with you to let you know that this was a bipartisan uh, exercise and effort. Uh, we have customs reauthorization moving forward. Um, I was a uh, conferee on the highway bill, conferee on the customs bill, so we're going to make sure those get moving. Um, TPP, you're going to hear a lot from the ambassador on that. I won't uh, go into any great detail other than to say uh, each side uh, of the aisle has its issues. And again, uh, the ambassador has been very available uh, to meeting with, uh, with both sides and listening and trying to find ways that we can address the concerns to, we think, uh, create uh, a, a piece of legislation, a trade agreement that uh, really sets that high standard uh, for fair and free trade uh, across this globe. So um, I, I think there was a point made earlier by the Secretary that your input into TPA when we went through that exercise was absolutely critical uh, in moving that over the line. TPP is is going to be harder. And, and so um, we've lost, uh, for example, we're, we're going to lose around 15 votes on the tobacco issue on, on the Republican side. So we've got to find some ways to, to move uh, issues like that forward. Your input, your uh, visitations with uh, a variety of members of Congress on both sides of the aisle will absolutely be critical in helping us move this is these issues forward. So thank you uh, for uh, recognizing me this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chancellor, if I could interrupt just a sure. second. We all hear that noise. It's not your imagination. We're trying to figure out what it is and turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Some voices in my head. Exactly. <laughs> Next, let me turn to Congresswoman Del Bene. Um, uh, thank you, Ursula, and thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're neighbors. My district is just north of Dave's up to the Canadian border. And you know, Washington State is the most trade-dependent state in the country, and four of the top ten most trade-dependent districts in the country are in Washington State, one of which is mine. And so this is, these are very, very important issues to, to our state and our entire region. Um, we're all going to have to leave early because we are going to have votes soon, and you're going to all be happy to see us leave because we will be um, voting um, to help reauthorize the Export Import Bank. So um, I want to thank um, Chairman Hockberg for all of his work um, for, for working hard there. <laughs> We're waiting for it to hear that bell go off over on the, on the, on the other side of the mall. Um, also, uh, I wanted to uh, bring up the important issue of safe harbor. Um, this is a critically important issue. I recently met with EU Commissioner Yurova and stressed the importance of getting a new safe harbor agreement in place. Um, I'm on the Judiciary Committee working very, very hard on a lot of our privacy and data issues and stress the importance of privacy to us in Congress and the work we've done on surveillance reform, continuing work we're doing on reforming the Electronic Communications Privacy Act to update our laws um, on technology. Um, but with over 4,000 U.S. companies currently operating in the EU who are relying on the Safe Harbor Agreement to harmonize the, or who are relying on the previous Safe Harbor Agreement, it's critically, critically important that we update the Safe Harbor Agreement. And when talking to, um, to, to Commissioner Yurova, 
Um, she stressed the importance of passing the Judicial Redress Act, something we passed in the House of Representatives but has yet to pass the Senate. That's going to be very, very critical for us um, to, to get that through so that can, we can reach productive conclusions to the negotiations there. Um, but again, um, XM Bank has been huge, and um, I want to thank, uh, again, um, everyone for their work there, and also very encouraged by the, um, by the importance of cross-border data flows in, and as represented in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, very important issue. Um, and I think something that is, we're gonna have to continue to educate folks on because some of the, the newer technology changes that have taken place since past agreements are gonna be important areas for us to focus on as well. So, and thank you, Ambassador Froman, for your work there. Um, so again, thank you, and, and we'll all apologize for, for leaving a little bit early, but, um, but Fred will help it make sure we get over to the Capitol quickly, <laughs> thanks. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. We'll actually push you out the door <laughs> on that. Um, I'd like to finally let me uh, turn it over to Congressman Kildee. Congressman. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for giving uh, us each a few minutes to comment. And as Congresswoman Del Benny said, when we leave, it will not be because we're rushing from the room due to something that Mr. Froman said. It's because we have to go vote. <laughs> let me um, let me focus a bit. And the goals of the of, of this organization are obviously critical to the success of this country and to the growth of our economy. But I want to hone in on a particular aspect of, of the challenge that we face. Um, and for those of you who are not aware, I come from uh, a town called Flint, Michigan. Flint is the birthplace of General Motors in 1908. GM was founded in that community. Uh, but it's a city that has experienced extraordinarily difficult times in the last several decades. So the focus that I, I want to bring and, and support is the focus of the, of the Export Council on the need to reinvest in our productive capacity. Obviously, there's been an important debate on how we engage global trade, and there will continue to be, I think, uh, very important debates within Congress as to how we do that. But as important as that, perhaps more important, is how we support expanding the productive capacity that we have here in the United States to make, to produce those sorts of products that we then can sell not only to our domestic market but across the globe. Essential to that, from my perspective, is a much stronger emphasis on reinvesting in those older industrial communities. And I think about some of the companies represented in this room, many of which were really born of innovation that occurred in the last century in those older industrial spaces that we have seen wither in ways that I think are really completely unacceptable. I, ju I just mentioned my own hometown of Flint, and I'll just use this one anecdote. Today, as we sit here in Flint, Michigan, a community that helped put the world on wheels, that community cannot ensure to its residents clean, drinkable water. It's a city of 100,000 people that for 14 months had lead levels in its water system that were so high. 7,000 children under the age of five for 14 months were exposed to lead in a way that will affect the trajectory of their lives permanently. This is in the 21st century in the wealthiest nation at the wealthiest moment in its history in a community that could greatly contribute to the productive capacity of this nation, but hasn't been able to fully realize that because we, as a nation, have allowed our older cities to atrophy. And so there is no trade agenda that can be fully realized that doesn't have us going big, going real big, investing in infrastructure, in ports, in rail, in roads and bridges, in IT, and in water infrastructure. So while we will take an important step forward in sort of getting back to where we need to be with a less than uh, uh, temporary approach to transportation infrastructure, um, I just really hope that we can, as a council, and particularly the private sector leadership, which is so critical to this question, find a way to move an agenda that has us reinvesting in those places that once were really important to the development of our productive capacity and I firmly believe 
are essential for that uh, in the future. Um, there are many cities, even during periods of economic growth, and I speak from experience. I was in local government for 33 years before I came to Congress. There are many cities that are often left behind, even during periods of great economic expansion. You go to the 1990s and see what happened and all the private sector job growth that we saw. The private sector job growth that we've seen in the last uh, five, six years has been extraordinary, but a lot of cities are left behind, and it's largely because we have not given them the tools that they need um, to succeed. When we see uh, some of our competitors spending, in some cases, 10 times what we are as a percentage of GDP on that basic infrastructure, and especially when we look at how difficult it is for these older cities to reposition themselves, I think it's incumbent on all of us, but it particularly uh, I'm, I'm imploring our private sector leaders to continue to speak up on this question because your voices are so critical. It's really important that we invest in these older communities. They can do wonders for our country, they can create greater equity, and they can actually grow our economy, but we've got to unleash their capacity, and it's going to take significant investment to do that. So thank you for giving me just a few minutes to, to thank mention Thank you very that. much, Congressman. A good message um, that we should think about. Now let's turn um, to the main portion of today's uh, program, and that's to hear from Ambassador Froman on TPP and other items. Well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, congratulations. Um, I'm Chair, congratulations, Ronnie, as well, uh, for your role here, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to, uh, to be here, particularly our, our friends from, uh, uh, from Congress uh, who've traveled down Pennsylvania Avenue to, to, to be here. Um, you know, after five and a half years, as you know, we were finally able to bring closure to the TPP negotiations in Atlanta uh, uh, about two months ago. And the final agreement is really good. Uh, it eliminates tariffs on manufacturing products. Uh, it eliminates or greatly reduces tariffs on agricultural exports in the areas where we have strong uh, agricultural export uh, interests. It effectively eliminates 18,000 taxes on American exports. These are the tariffs on our exports that will be eliminated in the countries with whom we don't already have free trade agreements. Uh, it opens up services markets, uh, financial services, express delivery services, electronic payment services, architect engineering services. We're the greatest service provider in the world. We have a, a huge uh, services surplus in our trade balance. And uh, this agreement will uh, open up markets for our service providers and keep open the ones, lock open the ones that are already open. Um, beyond that, when you look at the rules beyond market access, uh, we, we see strong intellectual, strong and balanced intellectual property rights rules, strong enforcement measures. Plus, this is the first trade agreement ever to take on the issue of state-owned enterprises. So that when state-owned enterprises are competing against our private firms, they have to do so now on a commercial basis or we'll have a trade action ability to bring a trade action against them. Uh, it's the first, as, as the Congressman was mentioning, this is the first trade agreement to take on the issues of the digital economy, the free flow of data, you know, not taxing digital products, uh, tariff-free information technology uh, products, pushing back against localization requirements, not requiring our companies to move to another country in order to serve that market in the digital space, and supporting e-commerce. You know, uh, we've met with a lot of small businesses, and you know, when those small businesses engage in e-commerce, they're using software services, to telecom services, electronic payment services, express delivery services, all of those are protected and made open through this agreement. And so it really helps, particularly the small and medium-sized business. Indeed, this is the first trade agreement to have a chapter on small and medium-sized businesses, a real focus on making sure that the various provisions of the trade agreement are working for uh, SMEs around the world, which we know are the drivers of much of the job creation here and around the Asia Pacific. Uh, it's also an agreement that it reflects both our interests and our values. So it's got strong labor and environmental protections, enforceable labor and environmental protections. It takes on issues like anti-corruption and requires countries to have anti-corruption measures. It takes on issues around development. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, as we set the rules for the road in this region and elsewhere around the world, that it reflects both our interests and our values. And we think what we've come up with has been a, uh, a very strong agreement. Uh, is it a perfect agreement? Absolutely not. Uh, uh, it's the product of 
uh, hard-fought negotiations and compromise uh, with 11 other countries, but sometimes even with our own domestic constituencies where we have divided interests. And so uh, we don't expect everyone to be equally uh, enthusiastic about it, but we do think at the end of the day uh, that it is a very strong agreement for manufacturing, for agriculture, for services, for workers, for farmers, for ranchers, for entrepreneurs, uh, for innovators, and for small and medium-sized businesses. And um, you know, I just came back from Asia uh, with the president. He was there for the APEC meetings and the ASEAN meetings uh, in Malaysia. And there is a palpable sense of uh, excitement and momentum in the region around TPP, both among the TPP countries themselves, who are all going through their own domestic processes of seeking approval, uh, but also the non-TPP countries, many of whom have raised their hands and say they want to be considered um, uh, for the possibility of coming into TPP sometime uh, in the future, obviously with, in our case with, with the support, uh, with the approval of Congress. Um, uh, and even countries like China, where I, I went uh, after uh, Malaysia, they follow TPP very closely they know they're going to need to compete in a TPP world, and that's going to require them to up their game uh, as well, which is in, 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 all, of our, uh, in all of our interests. Uh, we completed this agreement in, in, uh, uh, in early October. Um, about a month later, we published the agreement. It's on the web, all of it. Um, we put out uh, summaries of every chapter. Uh, we've got 20 plus fact sheets on our website. We're working very closely with uh, the White House and the Office of Digital Strategies to put out more and more information, make sure we're addressing questions and concerns uh, as they arise. Uh, we are uh, looking for ways to engage further with small and medium sized businesses. Uh, Gene had some interesting ideas last night and yeah, we want to continue to explore what ideas might be for getting the message out around the country uh, to your, uh, to your, to your, uh, uh, to your company, to your clients, to your customers, to your supply chain, your employees. Uh, to make clear what's really uh, what's really at stake there, uh, and as as uh, Jeff mentioned, we've got a whole whole of White House, whole of government uh, operation underway here uh, to engage with Congress and to get it passed. Uh, here at the White House, Jeff, Valerie, uh, Katie Fallon, really leading the way uh, on behalf of the president. The whole cabinet's involved. Uh, Penny has been uh, at the leading edge of traveling around. Uh, the country, talking to members of Congress, talking to businesses about the Im importance of it, uh, but also uh, 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 Anthony, uh, Tom Vilsack, uh, Jack Lou, uh, Maria, uh, have all been very much out there. Fred, of course, has been out there um, talking about the benefits of this. And we're committed not just to getting this passed, but making sure we're doing everything we can to help American businesses take full advantage of the new openings in the market, you know, whether that's through our export uh, promotion activities uh, that, that Penny and, and uh, uh, Maria uh, lead or our export finance, uh, trade finance uh, uh, capabilities uh, that Fred and Maria are, are focused on as well. We want to make sure we're doing everything possible for American workers and American businesses to, to, take, uh, uh, to take full advantage of it. You know, as, as uh, Chairman Reichert said, um, trade votes are always hard. This is going to be a tough battle. Uh, we're already up uh, on the Hill talking with Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, um, individually in small groups and larger groups to answer their questions. Uh, we're convinced at the end that we'll have the necessary support, but it's only going to happen if they fully have an understanding of the benefits uh, of this agreement for their constituents and how it's going to affect jobs and growth uh, for, their, uh, for their companies and for their workers in their, in their districts. And we look forward to very much working with you in that regard. Thank you, Mike. Very good. Before um, you address any other items on uh, the trade agenda, why don't I open and um, invite members of Congress to, to speak, uh, members of the administration and the cabinet to speak, I mean. And Mr. Fox, if you would please start. Madam Chair, uh, congratulations. It's great to be with you and also to our new vice chair. Congratulations. Um, I uh, just have a couple of uh, points here. First of all, I want to just say how proud I was to join the President, the Vice President, uh, Ambassador Froman, Secretaries uh, Pritzker and Perez on pushing for this TPP agreement. Um, the administration-wide focus and efforts here have been extraordinary. And um, we have to be even more extraordinary as we turn the corner to get uh, the final passage. One of the things that I've tried to do 
in advocating for TPP is to really galvanize the transportation community around the benefits of it, and in particular, the port communities that stand to gain so much from a robust uh, TPP uh, arrangement. Um, our port communities handle 95% of our imports and exports. And so that's really where the front lines of this uh, package are going to hit. And as you all know, our ports are the economic engines and job creators of our country. And uh, so we're going to continue to galvanize that community in particular. Um, but another part of my work is also being making sure that once this deal happens, that the, uh, the trucks and the trains and the other uh, uh, modalities that are needed to move freight around this country uh, aren't uh, running on broken track and potholes. Uh, and so it is very um, uh, fitting. Uh, I think last time I was here, I made a Ritwin, Harry, and Sally uh, reference. And uh, I'm now having a little what Michael's having, which is floor action on a transportation bill, which is great. <laughs> uh, the House and Senate have agreed to a five-year, $287 billion bill. It's called the FAST Act. And I just want to tell you just three quick things about what this act will do in this space. Um, the first thing is that it will have a national freight strategic plan, a four and a half billion dollar plan funded over five years. Um, and this is an important step. It's one of the things we asked for in the package the president and I submitted. Um, we're going to have 45 percent more freight uh, pressure on our system going forward, and that's probably without TPP being scored into it, 65 percent more trucks on the road. Um, so this will be a dedicated program focused on freight. Um, the one underbelly of this is that it caps non-highway efforts at 10 percent. So the rail and the inland, inland waterways and some of the other modalities aren't going to get as much of this program, but this is where we're going to keep pushing for more down the road. Secondly, there is, are some significant streamlining provisions that will ease the uh, efficient delivery of transportation projects and, and move those forward much faster. And then finally, we've talked a lot about public-private partnerships. Part of what the bill does is create an innovative finance bureau, which builds on the President's Build America Transportation Investment Center efforts to create more public-private partnerships. We look forward to a more consolidated set of government loan programs that will be part of this, and we will also be putting pressure on the markets to help us deliver infrastructure through public-private partnerships through the Bureau. So I think this is good news. Um, it's a good start, as Jeff said, but we gotta, we've got to do more, and we will continue to push Congress to do more in the future. And this, again, I think is part of trying to help the trade uh, agenda for our country move forward. Thank you very much, Secretary Fox. Thank you. Um, are there any other government officials or members of Congress who wish to comment on TPP? Please. I, I, I just wanted to add that in addition to all of the um, opportunities that we've mentioned with respect to trade, I think one of the other aspects uh, to keep an eye on is the fact that it's important to build the infrastructure for trade. And as Secretary Fox mentioned, building the infrastructure here, but this, there are also significant opportunities for U.S. businesses to build the infrastructure abroad for trade and to receive trade. And these are significant opportunities both in services as well as goods for U.S. businesses. And at USTDA, we see we're doing the project planning already in those areas, and we want to encourage U.S. business to take on opportunities and take advantage of these opportunities as well. And that's what TPP brings as well as the trade opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary um, Perez, do you have sure. anything to add? Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for stepping up to the plate as chair. And it's always great to have a Maryland resident as the vice chair. So Arnie, good to see you again. Uh, you know, I, earlier this year, the president dispatched me out to uh, California. There was a labor dispute at the West Coast ports and uh, had an opportunity firsthand to see um, the ripple effects of that dispute. And uh, I learned a lot. You know, perishable goods are not simply food. <laughs> you, know, you don't sell skis in May. You, know, you try to sell skis before the ski season. Uh, same thing with clothing. And um, talking to uh, farmers, talking to retailers, talking to um, so many people during that really highlighted to me uh, the importance of this agreement. And uh, spending time with mayors 
up and down the West Coast uh, who, uh, whose you know, communities are dependent on having robust infrastructure uh, really taught me the importance of what we're doing here. And uh, I've been very proud to be part of this uh, because uh, the fact of the matter is that the labor provisions in TPP are the strongest labor provisions that have been ever negotiated in any trade agreement. And uh, the President's North Star has always been creating a level playing field you know, for workers and for businesses alike. And, and what we have sought to do in the labor agreements, uh, the labor provisions, is to make sure that uh, we can meaningfully improve the status quo. Um, the reality, when you look at the, the history of, of labor provisions and trade agreements, NAFTA was the first um, trade agreement that had labor provisions, and, and it was a start. But it was, with the benefit of history, an inadequate start. Labor, for, labor provisions back then you know, were, frankly, still at the kids' table. Labor provisions and TPP are at the adults' table. They're very much at the grown-ups' table. Because all the dispute settlement issues that are in place for IP, for all the other uh, chapters of, of TPP, labor is at the adult table. And in addition, you know, we recognize that um, there are certain countries for which um, there are things that need to be done before you even start. Uh, we've spent a lot of time, for instance, and I'm proud of the work that we were able to do helping uh, uh, Mike and his team uh, with Vietnam. And, and there is an annex. There's, a, there's an additional consistency plan. It's not a side deal that has second class status. It's embedded in TPP. Because right now, frankly, the reality in Vietnam is that you can get arrested for union organizing and put in jail. Um, the reality under TPP is that they have made a commitment not to do that, an enforceable commitment. And they will have to make changes in their laws before TPP goes into effect. In other words, before they uh, get the benefits of, of TPP. And so uh, that's one example of how not only do we have a floor that is the, the most robust floor that we've seen in the labor context, but in addition, we recognize that specific countries had specific things that they needed to do in order to uh, be able to avail themselves of the benefits of TPP. Now, as, as um, you know, Chairman Reichert and, 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 and uh, Ambassador Froman and others have said, there's obviously viewpoint diversity on this. And uh, trade agreements have always had bipartisan support and bipartisan opposition. And I've spent a lot of time with, our, um, with, with folks who have supported uh, TPA. And I've spent a lot of time with folks who have not supported TPA, but have nonetheless very much educated us in terms of what their concerns were. And so we're continuing to have a very, very wide uh, tent of, of outreach because uh, so many of the provisions on the labor front were informed by the conversations that we've had. And I'm very proud of the work that lies ahead. And, and uh, I'm very proud of the fact that you know, we were able to play a, a, a small role in this. So um, we've we got a lot of work moving forward, but I I'm really look forward to talking with people, already have done so, about um, the toughest labor provisions in any trade agreement that we've ever seen. So thanks for giving me a few minutes here to talk, and I'm um, happy to answer any questions folks might have. Thank you very much, Secretary Perez. And I'd like to now call on Mayor Buckhorn, who would like to speak as well. Madam Chairwoman, thank you very much for uh, giving America's mayors a voice, mm -hmm. albeit a brief voice at this table. Um, we, what happens in this zip code trickles down to those of us who uh, actually have to execute and make these things happen. And, and uh, we are appreciative of the efforts that have gone on here. We have, uh, as a organization, have stood uh, shoulder to shoulder with Ambassador and with this administration in encouraging the passage of uh, TPP because we know what it means for our communities. I mean, just by way of example, in my city, in Tampa, uh, Port Tampa Bay is the largest port in the state of Florida. It is 5,000 acres. Uh, it is the closest port to the Panama Canal. And with the widening of the Panama Canal, there are tremendous opportunities that will exist for us. It directly and indirectly contributes to about 80,000 jobs in my city. 
And so for us, trade matters. And it's not some esoteric principle. It, it, it supplies real jobs for our friends and our neighbors and the people that we represent. And so we are absolutely in support of this. We are standing up a task force at the Conference of Mayors under the direction of Mayor Rawlings Blake, uh, which we will roll out at the conference meeting in January. Um, but, but I want you to know that, number one, we are thankful for what you are doing, but most importantly, uh, that the mayors are um, engaged in this debate. Uh, we are talking to the members of Congress that represent our cities, and we are encouraging them strongly to pass this bill. And if you think about it for Tampa, our top markets are Mexico, Canada, and Brazil. And Mexico alone translates to about a billion nine in trade exports. The one common denominator with all those countries is that we have existing trade agreements with them. And so what the TPP does is allow us access to 40% of the world's economy. And if you think about the fact that the bulk of the growth in this country, over 90% is coming out of metro economies, the opportunity to expand those horizons and create opportunities for small and mid-sized businesses on Main Street is significant. And so while cities may not think that they're affected by trade, I can tell you in very real terms, um, it makes a big difference to us. And so we will put the broad shoulders of mayors to work on this as we have. Uh, we, we rescued Ambassador Froman from the negotiations and got him out of the hotel as a number of mayors flew to Atlanta to do, it, to do a press conference. Um, in support of, of his efforts, and uh, we are thankful that the business community is engaged in this, um, but just know that the mayors are, are standing there with you. So thank you for allowing us to be here, and thank you for a few minutes, Madam Chairman. You're welcome, and uh, we like the force of the mayors. Uh, that's a, a good idea, a good, good metaphor. Are there any other members um, of Congress that would like to speak? Now, I know that there are a, member, a number of council members who want to make some comments on TPP as well. Let me begin with uh, our exiting member, Pat Wirtz. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I would also like to congratulate Ambassador Furman and his strong negotiating team on, on uh, this deal. It truly represents, from the food and agricultural perspective, a historic, uh, historic um, trade agreement and should make food and agricultural products more easily accessible. They will be delayed less at borders. They will be less taxed. Uh, they will be more efficient and cost effective for not only the United States, but the global community. That's uh, a very big deal. So thank you for that. Um, ADM and, and our sector stand ready to support this in every way possible. Um, my suggestion would be, as we did with TPA, sharing best practices, whether it's at the grassroots level, at the congressional level, everything we can do to help constituents understand the benefits of this uh, so that we stand ready to help it secure passage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, David Abney from UPS. <coughs> Thank you, Ursula, for the opportunity to make a few short comments about uh, TPP. Since you passed this very uh, deadline-oriented, when you said short, I understood that, so I'll make sure and stay within those guidelines. But we are absolutely thrilled that the concluding round of TPP negotiations occurred in our hometown of Atlanta. We've uh, mentioned that a few times all across the world, I think. <laughs> but uh, what really excites us about this, though, is that this agreement is uh, advancing issues real issues that exporters throughout the U.S. need in order to compete around the world. U.S. export right now is under a lot of pressure for various reasons. We understand that, and this certainly will, will help in that regard. We are encouraged, as uh, Ambassador Froman pointed out earlier, and it's something that, uh, that I used yesterday a lot when I was meeting members of Congress, and that's how this agreement has a chapter focused on small and mid-sized companies. Many of those small and mid-sized companies think that it's just entirely too complicated and too difficult to export. This will go a long way in helping advance that. And this, I've noticed, does get traction to people that are on the fence uh, about trade when you start talking about how it can affect those small and mid-sized uh, companies. We also think it's a, a historic agreement with the size that was just pointed out, 40% of the economy. 
but creates real market opportunities for U.S. companies of all sizes to just have a, a more level playing field. Certainly appreciate all the work the administration and, and Congress has done so far and will have to do to ratify TPP. It's not a slam dunk, we all know, but I just could not thank Ambassador Froman and his team any more than I, I did last night and again today on the hard, hard work that you have done to get this to this point. Now all of us working together have to make sure that we push this to the finish line. And uh, I'm sure that we will, but I think we'll face some more uphill battles before we get there. But as I've uh, committed to you before, anything that UPS can do to help advance this, we certainly will do so, but really appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much. Um, Andres Glaski from AES. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank uh, Ambassador Froman for all the hard work he's done. What I wanted to add a little bit was the perspective of, of a non-exporter. Uh, we buy a lot of goods and services. We would like to buy American, and I'm very happy with the news we heard today about getting the Exim Bank hopefully <laughs> approved so that we can compete fairly, because we have to win every single bid, every single infrastructure project, and so we need American producers and goods and services to have the same advantages as foreign. I also would like to talk a little bit about uh, the case of Vietnam that Secretary Perez uh, mentioned. We have a $10 billion investment program, construction programs underway today. We just completed a $2 billion plant in Vietnam, which is a TPP country. We uh, were able to do this project thanks to the support of Commerce, the Commerce Department. USTA was, uh, USTDA was involved from the very beginning. But what's very important is that we completed this project with like 10 million man hours without a lost time incident. Zero fatalities, of course. And this is unique for Vietnam. So one of the encouraging things is the Vietnamese government is actually bringing people over to our site to see how this was done. So I'm very happy to hear that in the TPP it's including this raising of labor standards, of security standards. And I can say from our own experience that uh, they are hungry for this. They really do want to improve the quality of their safety programs. So just a, a call out for all um, non-exporters, those of us who actually will be helping buying goods and services to support the TPP. Uh, and I think that that will also help give it a lot of credibility if those who aren't so directly involved support this. Thank you. Welcome, not only goods and services, but also good practices, which is uh, outstanding. Robert Wolf of 32 Advisors. Turn your, turn your mic on. Oh. I'm from a trading floor, so usually I don't need a mic. <laughs> First, I think we have to have a hashtag Giving Tuesday like every day because it's amazing that the agreements for both the Exum reauthorization and the highway bill took place Tuesday. So, so maybe we should uh, continue that. But on a, a more sobering aspect to that celebration is being from finance, we look at the facts, and we just had the ISM numbers come out and manufacturing hit a five-year-plus low. And we cannot ignore what the strength of the dollar and the lack of global growth is doing. And therefore, what's critical to our success is breaking down barriers and protectionist rules and making sure that the U.S. is on an even playing standard, as Secretary Perez said, both in labor and the environment. I don't have any skin in the game. TPP is critical. There's nothing else you can say that we need to make sure we are selling our U.S. goods and services at what is the fastest growing part of the, of the world's the economy. We ha for us to compete with China, we have to compete with the people that are doing business with them day in and day out. So I would just say that as someone who has been advising businesses for my 30 years on Wall Street, it is time to make sure that once again, like we did in the past budget and debt ceiling deals, that we start working together between the business, Congress, and the White House, and the cabinet members to make sure we know the facts, but to make sure that the employees and the nation know the facts. Because when you talk about the facts about reducing trade tariffs and actually having standards from an environmental basis on a level playing field, and talking about being able to literally sell our good and services in a different way, we need to make sure that people understand that. So I will just tell you 
Um, although uh, the rhetoric out there during this presidential debate season seems to be all against it, we need to actually also make sure we all have our bully pulpit and make sure that they know the facts, how important this is. So I just want to say that you know, maybe we need to have uh, more Giving Tuesdays to get Congress to support something that's important to our country. So I want to thank you, uh, Ambassador Froman and Secretary Pritzker for everything you guys are doing by really taking this on uh, with, with broad, and broad shoulders and real passion. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wolf. Um, are there any other PEC members who would like to comment? Yeah, please, Gene. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and congratulations uh, to you, Aunt Arnie. Um, the SME committee is just so elated that um, what we consider an awesome piece of negotiation to have that SME chapter included in the TPPA. And uh, just for the record, uh, we stand ready to mobilize the small business community across the United States to help carry this over the goal line. So again, Mr. F uh, Ambassador Foreman and your team, I think uh, is very awesome in how you've handled the negotiations on this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it seems like the administration is all in, the PEC is all in, we have the mayors uh, in. So we'll work toward it if you can spend a, a brief time on other economic matters. Sure.